All right, welcome to the. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the 97th semester of what physicists do. It's exciting, actually. 97. Um, I'm Professor Scott Sieverson. I'm, I'm uh, running the series this semester, and uh, I am, have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ransom Stevens. Uh, he's a friend of the department, having uh, spoken in the series twice, but when I looked, I saw it's been actually too long. It was last in 2011, although we're having a hard time believing this. Uh, he once gave a really a great talk, it's available at the library, a great exaltation of physics as a degree, that was one of his talks here. And he also gave a talk also available um, as a DVD you can watch uh, at the library, is a fascinating look at the life of Emily Noder, uh, a preeminent mind in physics and math of the 20th century. Um, Dr. Stevens is an accomplished author, speaker, and scientist. Uh, he has his Ph.D. from uh, the University of um, California, Santa Barbara. His bachelor's was from UC San Diego, um, both in physics. In his early work, he was a member of the team that discovered the top quark. Uh, he eventually left his, um, his full-time full science uh, professorship uh, from UT Arlington um, to work in industry. Uh, where he had a, also a career, another career in, in industry, working at Enhanced Messaging Systems and later Agilent, which I assume is what brought you to the, to the area, right, Agilent? Well, it helped. It helped, okay. Um, well, this brought him uh, much success, and, um, and now he uh, left that to work as an author, speaker, and technologist. Um, one of his recent books, and I think uh, related to today's talk, is called The Left Brain Speaks and the Right B B Brain Laughs, uh, and is a look into neuroscience. And this is um, his, his talk ab about that, that idea and connecting it to, um, as we see here, innovation and creativity. Let's give a warm welcome to our friend and colleague, Dr. Ransom Stevens. Did you just take my tea? Yes, I did. <laughs> you gotta watch these astronomers. <laughs> They'll take your tea. Well, thank you very much for having me, Scott, and thanks for that, that um, very nice uh, introduction, which I did not write verbatim. Um, so, right, so um, this is the series of lectures on what physicists do. And I'm a physicist, and being a physicist wraps, wraps up in your world in many, many ways, because more than being merely a body of knowledge that you acquire, it's really more of a way of thinking. So you might consider physics as sort of a brainwashing opportunity, but it's a very healthy one, and because it opens lots of doors. So in the theme of what physicists do, I wrote a book on neuroscience. So you might say, as I did when the publisher asked me to write a book on neuroscience, but I'm a physicist, why would I write a book on neuroscience? And her response was, you just spent half an hour telling me all this stuff about neuroscience. And I know you're a writer, so you're a science writer, you can write about whatever the hell you want. So I, so I, uh, yeah, I wrote a book on neuroscience for her, she was the publisher at Viva Editions who published this book. Now, when I finished the first draft of this book, I thought to myself, all right, okay, so here's a bunch of neuroscience, but what, what pulls it together for me? Why did I, you know, I knew why I was doing it. And the reason I wanted to write on neuroscience is so that I could write better novels, so that I could write novels that clicked with people's feelings of what is good and what is bad in a novel. But I also wanted to be able to solve problems in technology, because I still work in technology, and I, you know, I don't want it to take so long, right, to do something really hard. I just want it to be easier. So I, I sat there and went through it, and I came up with a model. Well, really a strategy for how to solve problems, how to approach challenges of every type, including homework problems that you haven't been able to solve. It will work for that too. So it is a technique for juicing the process, if you will. And here's the agenda. 
I've split this into three parts. And first, in 10 minutes, we will discuss how your brain works. And then we will talk a little bit about talent and skill for no other reason than I think it's really interesting. And then finally, we will do this model for improving in innovation. It's kind of a slight diversion in the middle on talent and skill. It begins like this. First, we have to destroy this oversimplification that your left brain is your inner accountant and your right brain is your inner artist. This, this oversimplification came from observations made in the very early 60s, where it was observed that in, in your brain, if you blocked off signals between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, if you deadened signals in the left hemisphere of your brain so that you were only operating on the right hemisphere, then when you drew a horse, it would look more three-dimensional that if you played an instrument, you would play with greater abandon. And so it, this, this oversimplification came to be. And the way that science works is sort of a process of one oversimplification being replaced by another as we work our way sort of up this ladder towards the truth, towards what's really going on. So that was in the 1960s. Time has passed. And so it's time now to upgrade our left brain, right brain oversimplification. And we can do that very simply. You walk into a bar. I like bars as examples because I usually think of them when I'm in a bar. <laughs> so this is the metaphor for how your left and right brains work. You walk into the bar and what are you thinking about? Well, you're thinking about which IPA you want. So you go in and you're looking at the taps the row of taps there behind the bar, and all the different beers. Okay, this is what you're focused on. This is what your left brain is doing. It is zeroing in. But, of course, there's lots of things going on. You go on, there's sports events on all the TVs, there's a cooking show over here, there's a bunch of people talking, there's no end of sense in bars. Bars are smelly places. Generations of beer have been spilled, people have barfed, there's all kinds of stuff going on. But your left brain's focused on the taps. You walk in, somebody says your name. Now there's this cacophony going on, right? But if somebody says your name, the odds are very good that you will hear it. If they say anything else, it's just noise. But if they say your name, the odds are really good that you're going to hear it. And that's kind of amazing. If you go ahead into some um, project lab, I love project labs, but if you do one and you write some software that tries to identify your name in a very noisy environment, you will find that it will take more than a semester to do this, to accomplish this. Maybe a few semesters. Maybe it won't work. But you can do it. All right? And that's your right brain. Your left brain is zeroed in on one thing. Your right brain is looking out for what's going on. This comes about through the process of evolution because your left and right brains serve multiple functions. First, just like you have a, a right arm and a left arm, they're redundant. If you lose one, you can survive at least for a while on the other. But also, they're complementary. They do accomplish somewhat different tasks. And here's your all new left brain, right brain oversimplification. Your left brain is a fascinated child, zeroing in on whatever it's focused on, working on it. And your right brain is looking out for your left brain. It is the indulgent parent. Equivalently, your left brain is a delusional idiot. And your right brain is a judgmental asshole. And the reason I say this is because it is your left brain that has fantasies that go zeroing off and on and on. And if you're, the chemicals and processes in your brain aren't balanced, aren't functioning the way they ought to, then you lose the ability, your right brain loses the ability to reel in your left brain. And those delusions can seem real. And that becomes very unfortunate. But, so we move on. And this is your oversimplified brain in three easy pieces. All right, I want to be careful here. Because when we describe topics in science, 
We like to use metaphors. Metaphors are powerful ways of describing things because we can swallow them whole and it gives us a way to think about how something else works. But when we use these metaphors, we have to be very careful because they aren't the science. They're a way to look at the science. And if we take the metaphor too seriously, well, it'll walk us off into the weeds and we'll think things that are wrong. So let's think of this rather than, certainly not as a theory or even a model of the brain, but as a metaphor. And it's not a bad metaphor at all. And it works like this. We can separate your brain into three separate pieces that are tightly networked together. And the order of these pieces follows the order in which your brain evolved through natural selection, through trying random things and seeing what works. The survivors worked, the failures didn't work on a broad averaging. And at the base of your brain is this thing, the cerebellum, and the brain stem, which I call your inner frog. It's often called the reptilian brain. But, I don't know, reptiles kind of gross me out, but I think frogs are kind of cool, so I'm going to call it a frog, okay? And what the frog does, your inner frog, it is, it handles your heart rate, perspiration, your balance. It's the thing that dances. And balance is a really hard thing to do, but you can do it really easily. And you can do it fast. I want you to notice that there's a time scale associated with these three different um, parts of your brain. The second one, your inner puppy. Your inner puppy is the part of you that barks and whines and licks faces. It is the part of you that has feelings and emotions. It is part of you um, also, quite likely, there's a lot of evidence, that it is the part of you that asserts that it understands something. I know this to be true. We all experience this, and without it, we really wouldn't get very far, because if you weren't sure you knew something, you really wouldn't know anything. Problem is that when you're sure you know something and it turns out you don't know it, that you still think you know it and you know, trouble ensues. Mm -hmm. But this is your feelings, your emotions, it builds your memories, and of course your four Fs, the fight, flight, freeze, and mate. It does all of these things. And then finally, on the outer surface, the wrinkly gray matter, which is a uh, it's about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch thick that goes around the outside of your brain. This is what I call your inner Feynman. Now, Richard Feynman was, of course, you're all aware, was the greatest American physicist. And um, so he was sort of a hero of mine. And I have, to, I have to apologize for this drawing of Richard Feynman. What happened was the publisher of this book told me that they would get the rights to a picture of Richard Feynman. And I had a picture of my dog and I had a picture of a frog. So we were gonna use those. And then two days before they went to press, they said, yeah, they're charging too much. We're not gonna be able to use that picture. So I, so I had to draw a picture of Richard Feynman. <laughs> and um, so he looked sort of like Liberace. <laughs> Liberace was a piano player who had a, a, a famous flair for candelabras. Anyway, so um, this is an older Feynman than the standard drawing. I wanted to do something that was a bit non-standard that came out as Liberace, which is, which is nice. So these three pieces are deeply interconnected, and your inner Feynman is the part of you that does your planning, your philosophy, your physics. You are here at Sonoma State University to feed your inner Feynman. But notice this, notice this. Your inner frog responds in 30 milliseconds to stimulus. Your inner puppy, two tenths of a second. This is how long it takes you to hit the brakes. This is the reaction time scale. Your inner Feynman, you're lucky if you're consciously aware of something in half a second. It's more like three quarters of a second. Feynman's slow, slow but smart. Um, those of you who have pondered the inner workings of computers might notice that, that the inner frog can make essentially seven decisions in the time it takes the inner puppy to make one. That's seven cycles to one cycle to well, well under a half, maybe a third of a cycle. 
So in the time that it takes you to be aware of something, your inner frog can be aware of it, well, 10, about 20 times, 15, 20 times. So there is a lot going on in your brain that you are not aware of. This is the basis for the model of creativity that um, we're going to go through. And the next step in that is very simple. Most of our thoughts are unconscious thoughts. We're not aware of everything our brain's doing. In fact, we're aware of an, a really tiny fraction of the number of things that our brain is busy. And it's not just that the heart rate and perspiration um, and hunger, that sort of thing, but really obvious things. Picture this. You walk into a room, and in that room is someone, it's 4.15. That means you got five minutes to roll one. Never mind. Um, sorry, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, um, what was I saying? I forgot. No. You walk into a room, and in this room, there is someone there who is very valuable to, to you or, or um, someone you either really like or really hate. All right, you walk in, go into this room, and what happens? Well, you see this person and you experience an emotional response. You see them, say it's somebody you like, you see them, you have some expectations of how they're going to respond to seeing you. You have some hopes, some worries. You also have something comes to mind, things come to mind, you want to talk about it, you want to share, because you're humans and we're very social animals. But that's not really what's going on. That's not what's going on at all. If I'm an alien from Andromeda, some silicon-based life form, and I watch this, what I see is a being come in, another being here, and light reflects off of one to the other. That light goes in to the eyes, where it excites the rods and cones in your eyes, which send electrical signals down your optic nerve that go to the back of your brain. At the lowest level, the occipital lobe, the back of your brain, processes those into cartoon-like images and immediately starts sending those all around your brain to identify them, to match them to patterns of different people and you start to recognize who this person was. And it's not just sight, it's their smell, the sound of their voice, the room where they are, whether you expected them to be there or not. All of these things come into play to recognize the pattern that is this person that you're very fond of. We are pattern recognizers. It's what we do, we do it extraordinarily well from recognizing the sound of your name in a loud, noisy bar to walking into a room and seeing another human being and knowing how they feel. We really recognize patterns. So I want you to put, to work, put it to work for you. The problem with this, being pattern recognizers, is that we match images to images that we've seen before. We match patterns into categories that we've already seen. If you have a round table, it will bring to mind a lot of different possibilities, maybe just having breakfast at the table in the kitchen. All right? But it's round for, it is round. And when you see something else that's round, well, you think of it's round. Maybe you see something elliptical and you think, eh, it's round, because you're lazy. It's not round, it's elliptical. So the problem that we run into is that we tend to force fit our perceptions into already existing models in our brain, already existing patterns. It's easier to look at something and say, oh, that's round, than it is to look at it and actually pay attention to it. You have to do it fast or you're gonna get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. So um, <laughs> that brings us then to the percolation metaphor. Now I, I look out around me and I see a tiny fraction of people who actually have ever drank coffee brewed in such a primitive, <laughs> horrible fashion. But lo, there was a time when coffee was brewed in this way. Prior to the proliferation of the cappuccino maker, even before the drip coffee maker was the percolator. 
Now, percolation is a physics phenomenon that pops up in lots of, in lots of different ways. Physics is like that. When we solve a problem um, in one space, that same problem comes up in different ways. And percolation is one of those. And here's how it works. A coffee percolator. So you set this, this um, vessel onto a stove and you have some heating element here and you fill it up partway with water. You have a little basket that's got coffee grinds in it. And then the water boils and that boiling process pushes some drops up this tube. The tube, the water comes up the tube and it hits the lid of the percolator which deflects the drops. They fall down. Most of them go into the coffee grinds where they um, steep, if you will. They brew the coffee and then you have start with less brewed coffee here and then the drops come down and you have um, coffee, all right? And this goes on for a while and it produces a really horrible bitter brew that tears your guts to pieces. I advise against using it. By so, the way, that's what everyone drank. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So now the metaphor. These, this water down here that's being heated, these are all the thoughts that are going on in your brain. This is you walking into the room and having light flash into your eyes. And what happens is that some of those thoughts, all right, here's a really annoying thing from a physicist's perspective about neuroscience. These guys haven't even defined what a thought is, okay? Don't even know what a thought is. We're just gonna go with it Okay, and pretend like it's science for a while. Anyway, so the boiling action, so you've got all these parallel processors, and some thoughts come up and go into the consciousness grinds. These are the thoughts that you are conscious of. And what pushes these drops, these particular thoughts, up into consciousness, well, there's a few things that will make certain thoughts conscious rather than others. And the easiest one, the most obvious one, is novelty. That novelty, now novelty is something you don't expect. Novelty is something strange, something that you're not anticipating. Those things will tend to burst into consciousness because you weren't expecting them. Now if you go walking, I don't know, if you, wa if you walk in here, and you walk out, and I ask you what color the rug is, the carpet is, you probably won't be able to tell me. Same thing with the seats. You might remember, but who cares? You know, it's the same. But if you come in and they're different, you'll notice. You might not remember what they were before, but you'll know that they're different because it's novel. So novelty will make thoughts, will boil thoughts into consciousness. Another thing that will boil them into consciousness is if you are looking for them, if you're hoping to see them, or if you expect to. But if you also expect to, like the carpeting, and they're just, you know, you, you have it built in, it's routine, you're not looking for it, it's just part of the background, then they won't, they won't boil up into consciousness. And the reason is pretty simple. The reason is that we are capable of holding three to seven, maybe ten separate thoughts in our consciousness at one time. Maybe. But, there's a ton of stuff going on. There are a lot of thoughts that are available to boil up into consciousness. All right, so the takeaway from this for innovation and creativity is that there are all this processing power going on. Now, there's it's simple processes. It's not like you're in refinement. It's not, it's not going to, each one of these, no one of these is going to solve quantum electrodynamics for you. But there's a lot of them. Whereas your conscious brain, there's really, you know, three to seven thoughts at a time. It's powerful, but, you know, really limited. So there's a lot going on in the base. And here's a really cool thing. I think this is the coolest thing I learned writing this book. It's called neural pruning. And here's how it works. Any of you familiar with synesthesia? Okay. So synesthesia is this, well, I hesitate to call it a disorder because it seems like it'd be so cool. And that is that 
your thoughts, or rather your senses, seem to have crosstalk when you have synesthesia. And what that means is that you might see a color and, and experience it as a taste. You might hear a sound and experience it as a scent, as a smell. Crosstalk. Now, the most common way that synesthesia emerges, and this is something I've personally experienced, is you associate numbers with colors. Blue for, or four, for example, is blue. I don't know why. In my brain, four always seems sort of blue to me. But that's the sort of thing. Now, when you were born, when you were a small tyke, before you were, uh, when you're about two, two to three, you had two to 300 times more synapses, more um, axon connections in your brain than you did when you were four, and far more than you do now for most of you. And what happened was this. This is the idea. There's a, there's a tidy pile of evidence for this, but it's not conclusive. And the evidence is, the idea is this, that when there is an infant, that infant doesn't know the universe, right? It doesn't know what to expect. It's got no expectations. Sure, it's got instincts and stuff. It's all prepared to learn a ton, but it doesn't have any experience. So what happens is the brain just starts growing, throwing off connections and connect them all across the brain, and the infant will reach out with a hand and touch something and experience that all at once as, a, as vision, as sound, as taste, and that sensory touch. All of them. Sound, touch, taste. What did I leave out? Smell. 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 What? Smell. And, um, and so as the infant grows, it starts to realize, you know, some of those connections just don't work. They don't repeat some of those impressions. If you expect to taste every time you touch a ball, well, you're going to be disappointed. And so nature always wants things to be more efficient. It is ultimately the, um, the, the dilemma of good, fast, or cheap pick two. And of course, nature always picks fast and cheap, fast and efficient, because that will keep you safe, even though it might make you an idiot, because it's not good. But hey, better safe and alive than dead. And so anyway, here it is. And as you experience the world, your brain snips off the, the connections that don't actually help you interpret the world. And you bottom, you, you uh, remove those connections as you come to term with reality. And, um, and then you lose this synesthesia, or most of us do. All right, that brings us to talent and skill. So the trick with talent and skill is this. In my book, every, every chapter is separated into, into um, every chapter is two seemingly separate things that are remotely, that are tied very closely together, like talent and skill. So if we try to distinguish talent and skill by going to the asymptote. An asymptote is where you reach as far as you can to try and get the ultimate extremes so that you have something you understand. So for talent and skill, the talent, well, if I want to separate talent and skill, how do I do that? Because if I see somebody and they're good at something, then how, how do I tell if it's because they're talented or because they've learned how to do it? Well, okay, that's the trick. And one way to do that is to say, all right, Let's just say that talent is something that is purely from nature, that it's purely genetic. Well, even that, you need to assume that they're going to eat well and sleep well, that their parents didn't hate them, that sort of thing. Make some reasonable assumptions. And being tall is a talent for basketball, all right? Manute Ball stood seven feet, seven inches, and he had, he had a wingspan of eight and a half feet. This gives you an advantage at basketball, for Minute Bowl can dunk the ball by doing this. I can't. I have no talent for basketball. It always bounces off the rim. So Minute Bowl had this talent. Okay. So that means we're going to try and do something even more difficult. And that is to distinguish skill as something that is independent of talent. This is where it gets tricky. 
And that's where Muggsy Bogues comes in. Muggsy Bogues, five foot three inches, about this tall, okay? Five foot three inches, 12th pick in the first round of the NBA a long time ago, okay? An amazing basketball player. Um, of course, how did he do it? Well, he could out dribble anybody. He was faster than anybody. And boy, could he shoot, but he couldn't dunk the ball. Now, he could jump high enough, but his hands were too small. He couldn't hold it, get over it. So I, I probably couldn't dunk the ball either if I could jump that high. But he could jump that high. He just couldn't hold the ball because of the small paw. So how does Bugsy do it? Is this all pure skill? Or is it this, some natural agility that he has? Well, there's no way to tell. It's not observable. So separating, trying to separate talent and skill is, is a tough thing. And uh, Muggsy was an interesting guy. He grew up in, in Baltimore. Um, he was shot in the hand when he was a little kid. His father did time um, for drug possession, and he watched a man die beaten with a baseball bat when he was five years old. He went to high school and was a star basketball player. And you say, well, yeah, you know, he must have been, because look what he did later. But it's trickier than that, because his basketball, uh, his high school basketball team featured two other future NBA players. They were, of course, 6'6 six, six, and 6'8. Six, Muggsy was 5'3. How does this kid ever get on the court? I went out for basketball. I never got to step out there, right? I was, oh, yeah, keep him off, man. It always bounces off the rim, right? But wow. So a lot of skill, a lot of talent. I don't know. It gets weirder. I want you to consider the case of Joni B. Good. So uh, Joni, she, she played the guitar really, really badly. And um, her brothers and sisters and her parents said, nah, you can't practice that thing in here. So she put her guitar in a gunny sack and went out to the railroad tracks to practice. And what she did there was, well, she forgot her cell phone, so she didn't have her tuning app. So she had to learn how to tune her guitar um, from knowing pitch. So pitch, knowing pitch, perfect pitch, is that a talent or a skill? So pitch. Yes, oh, he's right into my trap. <laughs> yes. So um, pitch is, perfect pitch is the ability to distinguish different notes mm -hmm. without a reference. Or I can't do this. But I do know that this is low and this is high, right? Pitch. So you say, is this a talent or a skill? Wow. Gets kind of interesting. Because when Joni goes out there and plays her guitar, what happens is in um, the parietal regions of her brain where she processes sound and the other parts of her brain where she processes uh, reading notes and understanding music and melody, recognizing melody, which all builds your whole brain together. Music is like the greatest lab for studying neuroscience. But anyway, what happens is her brain starts getting bigger. Just like the infant had two to three times more um, axon connections, Joni starts growing them. Her brain just starts throwing out these connections and her pitch gets better. She learns to have better pitch. So is it talent or is it skill? Well, I can't do it. And I've tried to tune guitars for a long time. So I, I like to say it's talent because, you know, that's an excuse for why I can't do it. But we all know it's because I don't practice. <laughs> um, but there's a limit to her talent. Because if she has, this is the cochlea. The way that the cochlea works is really simple. There's all these little hairs in, your, in this canal. Here's your eardrums. And there's all these little hairs through it. And when one of the hairs is wiggled by a wave of sound, it excites an axon. It excites an electric current on a, well, a biological sort of wire that goes down your brain. And if you have the higher notes, only make it a little way into the cochlea. The lower notes actually go all the way in. Mm -hmm. So if you have cilia that are, act, that are active here, that are wiggled by the sound here, but not in here, then it's a higher pitch. Okay. It's filled with water. Well, it's filled with some you know, weird, gross biological fluid. There's a reason we do physics. Biology's disgusting. <laughs> 
But if I unroll it, if I un unroll it, you, will see, you would see that it is conical. Now, if Joni's cochlea is a perfect cone, then she might develop perfect pitch. But if her cochlea is imperfect, if it's got some defects, then she, her pitch can only get so good because this little problem, this little injury, if you will, is going to prevent some of the sound making it all the way up. So is it, is it talent or skill? Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It is talent or skill. Here's a couple of interesting things, or at least I think they're interesting. It is language. Human beings have an incredible talent for learning language. You're not born with the ability, with a tendency to, want to, to understand English. You're not born with a tendency to not understand Russian. No, no, any language will do. You can learn any language when you're a little kid. You can learn more than one, too, unless you're an American, right? Because we don't really speak any languages. <laughs> Ask anyone in England, right? Yeah, you speak American. That's not a language. <laughs> So we've got this, we have talents, and that's an amazing one. And when we abstract that, then we do something crazy, right? We have symbols, we develop symbols, we create them into words. And when we write, then we start to develop more strict rules of grammar, a syntax. And we keep doing this and we end up with mathematics of arbitrary complexity. But if we didn't start with this talent for learning a language, we would never get here. So, along those lines of Joni's perfect pitch, Minute Bull's ability to um, uh, stuff a ball to, to, and Muggsy Bogue's ability to dribble like a madman, um, this dude, Albert Einstein, his parietal cortex, that part of the brain that is associated with distinguishing, with, with, um, distinguishing spatial relationships and temporal relationships, in other, in other words, time and space, was, about, uh, was abnormally large. In fact, it lacked a fold. You know, the, the brain has got all these little wrinkles in it. Well, Einstein's, it seemed like it had, it had expanded, like it had swelled up and ironed out one of those folds. So you say, oh yeah, well, of course, he yeah, had this talent for understanding space and time. That's how he discovered relativity. Or you say, dude spent a lot of time trying to figure out space and time. His brain went crazy, growing all these, making all these connections. He's working on it like crazy. And if he'd ever figured it out, he would have gone and trimmed all those extra connections. But he didn't. <laughs> He burned 30 years studying general relativity. He could never quantize the damn theory. And no one else has. So, there you go. Talents and skill. So, when they merge, for example, how many of you can play a musical instrument? Everyone who can, raise your hands. Yeah, I wish I was one of you. <laughs> but anyway, here's how it works. You go, I, here I am, I think that's an E chord there. I know a lot of chords, I do. I know tons of chords. It takes me about 10 minutes to go from one to the other, <laughs> right? But if I were a real musician, then there's this transition from when you're like playing the note, to playing it and listening. Does that sound, yeah, I could sort of hear that song in it. To actually playing music, the same way that you type a keyboard, the same way that when you say a word, it comes right out without you having to dig it up, right? You don't have to spell a word before you say it. That's even backwards. So there is this transition of when you learn something. All right, let's get on with this. Um, passion, by the way, is what fuses those together. Who cares? Let's get to the point. Here we go. All right, so a model for improving your innovative prowess. Here it is. I, uh, I made these two diagrams. We're going to concentrate on this one because you already know how to do this one for the most part. This is where the juice is. So we start with stress. Oh, great. Stress. So stress to anything, whether it's a challenge, a problem you need to solve, any sort of problem, an opportunity, something has to cause you to care. And that is what stress is. Stress when you feel stress about something, it means you care. 
If you didn't care, you wouldn't feel stressed. You wouldn't think about it. Too much stress, and it, it starts to be hard to think. You get distracted by feelings of worry that you won't, you know, that it's stressful. Too little stress and you won't bother. You have to have stress in order to solve a challenge. Okay, well, the first step here is to get into the zone. This is a pretty simple concept. Um, this guy, Mihaly Cheek Sent Me Heidi, came up with this concept of flow. And yes, I have to write it out phonetically because I could, I, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with this, <laughs> right? So this is the perfect balance of stress and confidence. And what that means is this. It's that point when you are encountering a challenge where you feel like, I don't know if I can do this, but I might be able to. It's not, oh shit, I can't do this. And it's not, oh yeah, I can do this. It's right there, it's the cusp. It's that it's not sitting back in your chair, it's not falling out of your chair, it is at the edge of your seat, getting into the zone and experiencing flow. Because then you can focus and you can defocus. You care enough to push really hard but you're confident enough to relax a little bit. So, the next step is to analyze. You need to get all of the information you can about whatever the challenge is into your brain as fast as possible, all at once, and you need to do it in a special way. And that special way is that you do it without prejudice. All right, what I mean by that, what's this next one, yeah. What I mean by that is that, is that um, you want to assemble all the information, so you go through and analyze it. That means that if you're having trouble with some homework, or you're trying to create a new app, or a product, or understand some physical phenomenon, whatever you're after, or solve some problem in, with the administration at the university. Oh God, I'm tensing up already. <laughs> you go and you analyze it. You get all the information you can into your brain. And you do this in such a way that you don't try to solve the problem yet. You have to have enough confidence to just go through your notes, get it all in there. Just get it all in there and try not to solve it. If you start to get an idea for a solution, just Forget it, just get the information in there. And the reason you wanna do that is the analysis will pack your brain with the information. But if you're an expert, and you are an expert in whatever your challenge is, in all likeliness, it's the sort of thing that, that attracts you is that challenge that confronts you. You'll have some expertise. The problem with being an expert is that we already know too much. And since there are so many thoughts that are going on in our brain that we're not aware of, well, ideas that we, that we won't consider, there are ideas that could solve the problem that we will reject even before they become conscious. You have to fight that. And the reason is simple. No matter how much of an expert you are, if you could have solved this problem, you already would have, right? You're not an expert on this. So you want to use everything you have, all that expertise, but you want to do it without prejudice. And that is the advantage that um, undergraduates, children have. This is the advantage, this is probably the reason that people have, that people make their most innovative discoveries in their 20s and early 30s, is that they don't know enough to know it's impossible. I see this a lot with engineers who don't know thermodynamics and so really do try to do things that are impossible and fail mostly, but occasionally they get around it, do something really special. So that is the idea, well that is the concept of idea prejudice. So you get all this information into your head and you do it in such a way that you just let it percolate in around in there and then you need to distract yourself. And the idea of this is pretty simple. You've got these millions of processors that are highly tuned pattern recognizers. Let them do the work for you. If you direct them from top down, you're going to cut them off. You're going to inhibit their ability 
to solve the problem. So, where do you get your best ideas? Anybody? Where do you get your best? Sorry? On a walk. On a walk? I've had ideas. When you're sleeping, you wake up with it. A lot of people have their best ideas in the shower. Get a lot of great ideas, and I'm thinking of putting a whiteboard in there. <laughs> write them down. But um, I'll tell you where you don't get your best ideas. Right. No, you do a lot of great work at your, at your laptop, cranking away on your homework. So you do some great work there, but that's not where your most innovative ideas, it's not where you're going to have them. It's just not. And so I'm going to do something that the trustees of the California State University system might not like. I'm suggesting that you goof off. That's right. Not that undergraduates don't have a certain skill for this process already. <laughs> but I do recommend that the solution to your problem just might be that you're working too hard. All right, so where do you get your best ideas? Well, I, I, I find this is North Beat. This is um, from the lighthouse, right, at Point Reyes, along the Great Beach. This is a place where I've had some of my best ideas. My father claims that if he could spend enough time in the kayak that there is no problem he couldn't solve. <laughs> I've had great ideas in the black hole. I literally have been there and taken my notebook out of my back pocket and written down nearly world-changing concepts on things like noise analysis in high-speed network systems. And, um, and pattern recognition algorithms for identifying different particle physics processes right up there somewhere. Yes, yes, I hang out in bars seems like a good idea to a lot of people. I used to ride motorcycles and I had awesome ideas. And I think the reason is that when you're riding a motorcycle, your brain really has only one place it can be and it's not thinking about your thoughts. It's not solving your problems, it's keeping you, which is the reason that I no longer ride motorcycles. <laughs> I wanted to live. Oh, right, you're still here. So, um, focus and defocus play different <coughs> roles in engaging your, your uh, many, many unconscious processors to find patterns, to put the puzzle together. Our culture prioritizes hard work over results. I read an article in the Chronicle this morning, yes, I still take a hard copy paper, but I could lie to you and say that I read it online. It would be a lie, though. And I don't want to warp your concept of reality. We err on the side of focus. It's worked pretty well for us. And um, this is software engineers frequently have 48-hour debug sessions. How many of you have done an all-nighter trying to learn something? It's a really bad idea. This is like the stupidest way to try to learn something you can imagine. You're much better off going through all your notes and then going to sleep. You'll learn it, you'll learn it just as well, probably better. These kids, they aren't moving this. They can push as hard as they want. This is no, going nowhere. You know what they need to do? They need to go hang out in a bar, think of a lever arm, and come back with a big lever and a fulcrum. They can move it easily then. Ah, oh, kids these days. <laughs> all right, so we have distracted ourselves. You have, you have gathered all the information about your challenge into your mind. You've gone through your notes. You've thought about the lecturer and, and what that lecturer, what she covered in that chapter. You've read through the chapter again. You've done all this as fast as you can. You've gotten everything into your head, and then you went and did something else. Meditation is actually, I didn't mention that there, sort of alluded to by <coughs> going up to point raise, but meditation is a, really, is a really good way to let your brain process things, defocusing and not thinking about your challenge and letting all those parallel processors <coughs> do the problem solving for you. At this point though, now you're a couple of hours from doing the analysis. <coughs> You've done the distraction, now it's time to listen. Now it's time to let the thoughts percolate up into consciousness and you will have solutions. <coughs> At worst, you will have things you can try. At best, you'll have a bunch of things that will work. And the way that you have to do this to listen, actually, this is a case 
where um, sitting still and being quiet and not altering your stream of consciousness but listening to it is extraordinarily powerful. You will sit quietly and thoughts will come to mind and you will be tempted beyond temptation to leap out of your seat and go out try these solutions. Try the bug fix to the software. Try it. Don't do it. You have to sit there for at least 10 minutes, really 20. You should, you should sit there for 20 minutes. Don't write any of them down. You won't forget them. Don't write them down. Just listen. And the reason is that even if the first thought is the brilliant solution, well, you don't know that. You might have a better one coming. And if you start working on that solution, you'll never get the other one, or you probably won't. But also, just because it's not the solution to this problem doesn't mean that it's not going to be the solution of another one that's coming along. You're going to want to record all these ideas after you've listened for at least 10 minutes. You should really go 20. If you can go 30, you'll be, you know, change the world. So that then, when you listen, what you will experience is lateral thought to different degrees. So let me explain to you what lateral thought is. This guy here is Galileo. Changed the world, right? Now, I don't think there's some controversy over this, but I, I doubt that Galileo invented the telescope. Did Galileo invent the telescope? No, he didn't. But lenses, he didn't invent it. He, he saw, you know, he got hassled by the church for discovering Jupiter's moons and the fact that they didn't orbit Earth. It's heresy. But, um, the telescope is a very interesting example of lateral thought because lenses had been around for a long time. There had been lens grinders making magnifying glass, different lenses for different types of optical applications. The lateral thought, the disruptive technology that came about was when, hey, what if I take two of them and put them in a tube and then, oh, I can vary their focal lengths. So, oh my God, look at that. It's not orbiting Earth. They're going to kill me for this, <laughs> right? So that's lateral thought. It's one of these, often one of these ideas that you look back and say, boy, that was obvious. And I didn't really need to hang around a bar for two hours to come up with that. Good thing, anyway. Um, another example, the iPod. The iPod, now this is old technology now, but what, about... 10, 15, 12, I think it was 13 years ago. The iPod changed the way, changed the music industry. Do you know what the iPod is? The iPod is a hard drive with a user interface. That's all it is. This is not, this is, this is not $300 worth of equipment. This is, you know, 20 bucks. But it changed the industry. Why? Because no one had done it before. We'd always thought of music as being things that you bought, like just like with books, right? It's, oh, it's on paper, it's a thing. But no, no, it can be a file on a computer. It just took a while to put that together, and that was that. So here's another example. Um, Monet, abstract art. He actually made defocusing into art. The Impressionist came about and introduced this style of art where you, you know, it's not really good, right? It's not as good as a photograph. You can barely see the dude on the boat, right? <laughs> the hell is this? Well, the, it wasn't a coincidence that the Impressionists came into being about the same time that photography did. Now you have photographs. Well, now you don't need to have painters who create images accurately. It changed because instead of painting the image, what he's trying to do is paint the feeling to impose an emotion on you by how this art affects you. Now, humor is the best example of lateral thought because it's something that you experience all the time, hopefully. And it is this. When you tell a joke or you listen to a joke, you have basically it's a mundane story that you probably wouldn't listen to except you know that it's a joke so there's going to be a punchline. But it goes along this sort of mundane path and then at the punchline it takes a left turn or a right turn. It takes a turn and it does something that you don't expect. It is novel. A novelty occurs and it is absurd and harmless. 
these are the key ingredients to humor. That they, the punchline is something you don't expect, and it's absurd, and it's harmless, and you laugh. Laughter comes before speech, and it came about, or so they say in the books, who knows, who was there for the first joke, right? I don't know. But it comes from, we're all sitting around the campfire, and we hear something. There's something in the woods. Uh-oh, what is it? Oh, it's Bill. Oh, it's just Bill. So laughter tells people not to worry. It says, oh, it's funny. It's not real. It's absurd. Now, the more ways that you can interpret the punchline in an absurd way, the funnier the joke will be. If it's not harmless, then it's horror. Horror is almost the same thing as humor, but instead of being harmless and absurd, it's, it's dangerous and and horrible. Okay, so that brings us then to the part that you already know. And that is, now you've got all of your ideas. You've experienced lateral thought. You've got a bunch of new patterns to apply to this challenge. You recognize it in a different way. So what do you do next? Well, you go away and you prune away the dumb ideas. Just like the neural pruning, of um, the infant or Joni B. Good learning to have better pitch. You've got all these connections. Now you cut out the dumb ideas. But are they dumb? They might be dumb for this problem, but that doesn't mean they'll be dumb for another one. So I'd recommend hanging on to them, stashing them. You don't have to tell other people what they are because they might be dumb. And then, um, then you let your exper expertise fly. And the rest of this, you already know, is that you're going to winnow those down to the good, to the best of the possible solutions. And then your parallel processors will help you implement that solution to this <coughs> challenge. You'll work through it, you'll see more novelty, you analyze it, and the problem she has solved. So this is the process, and I, I guarantee you that it will, it will get you farther along in solving any problem at hand. I have actually made a small but non-negligible bit of money guiding um, s two software teams in Silicon Valley to solving problems that they couldn't, that they'd been struggling with for months by using this technique. But generalized to teams, which hence the bees, so you get it, hive mind, see where I'm going here, right? Um, so when you generalize it to teams, it's a, it becomes complicated based on mostly the egos of different people on the team. If they were all bees, it'd be easy. But um, yeah, there's lots of reasons that when you have teams, things get, get complicated. But I will leave that for another time. So this speech is actually the promotion speech for my um, neuroscience book. So here's the promo slide. We basically went through chapters four and nine and part of two and three. And uh, my favorite part is um, this business of consciousness, whether it's a threshold or a spectrum, but there's a bunch of stuff here. If you're interested, then you know, find it at the usual places. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me here at Sonoma State. <laughs> um, we're before the five o'clock hour, so I'd like um, an opportunity for one or two questions then, and only then will I um, suggest that those of you who need to leave could leave then, and then the rest of us will stay for extended questions till 5.15. So does anyone have a quick question for Dr. Stevens? No, because you want to be released. Okay, so those of you who have to run off to your things, please do so quickly and quietly. The rest of us are staying for question section, okay? Thank you. Oh, uh, if you read novels, this is my new novel. I, I had five uncorrected proofs that I, I brought, and you can have one if you want one. So you read an book. offer of free books, was that clear, of the five that are up there? <coughs> Thank you. Enjoy it. Excuse me, may I take a coffee? Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's start with these questions now. Um, You're welcome. So I'll start. My, my question is, um, in the early part, I recognize the science behind it, of brain anatomy and so on. 
the, the model at the end um, of creativity, um, can you describe where that is that that's informed, but is that coming from your model? And it, if, if, if so, um, uh, where do you feel the line is for you to present evidence for that rather than play with it and give it as a model? So the way that this, let me go all the way back to the percolator, where we have the, the metaphor <clears throat> for how the brain works. Now this is good, this is good. So this model here, this is, um, this is a, a more scientific look at the metaphor of the percolator, about how thoughts become, become conscious. Now novelty is well known to be something that will bring a thought into consciousness. It's easy to test for behavioralists. So the way that this fits together by having five senses so processed and reprocessed and reprocessed that it becomes a, a black hole, that you think of something like that, so abstract, really is a matter of building patterns on top of patterns. And so that comes from balancing the processes of these different parts of your brain and using their networks. Now, the lateral thought part, which is really the key, is a literal lateral phenomenon. The right brain and the left brain look slightly different. The left brain is sort of gray and the right brain is sort of white. The left brain is gray because it's made up of more neurons, more processing centers. The right brain is white because it's made up of more axons, more cables that reach across and connect different sections of your brain. That connect, for example, the part of you that dances to the part of you that cooks, that connects these different things. So when you're quiet and you beat back the prejudice, your conscious prejudice for some ideas over others, then you enable, you basically you disable a lot of the axons that would inhibit other axons. So you inhibit, the inhi inhib you inhibit your own inhibitions and allow patterns that you recognize to come up to consciousness. So this is, this is well, ba well backed up by science. And um, there's a book, Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which Daniel Kahneman won uh, uh, Nobel Prize in economics for his work matching um, this sort of neuroscience to economic <coughs> behavior. And he called it um, process system one and system two, that there's this, this background, this what I call sort of lower parallel processors, lots of things that you're unconscious of, to these things that you're more conscious of, that you contemplate, whether you're contemplating down into yourself or applying them externally. So I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I burned a few minutes. <laughs> yes? Because sometimes I uh, like to do crossword puzzles and word scrambles, and you'll get to somewhere where you just can't get the next one. And then I'll come back the next day and I'll immediately see it. There you that's go. Example, the that's play. exactly what's going on. Yep, that's what's going on. And so crossword puzzles and jigsaw puzzles are a really good example. Um, because they're kind of stupid ways to waste your time. What are you doing, right? I mean, especially jigsaw puzzles. If you wanted the picture, get the picture. Why is it all broken up? What's with you? So I, I had an experience that um, in, imposed on me an understanding of this phenomenon. And um, it was up at Lake Tahoe at Echo Lake, in fact, where some um, friends, some children of a friend of mine were making a crossword puzzle. And I was standing there looking at it disparagingly because, you know, why don't you just get the, what the hell are you doing? You're at Tahoe. You're wasting your life doing, oh, wow, this part goes here and this part goes here. There is a dopamine drip to solving these problems, that it is emotionally fulfilling to solve problems. So we, are, we naturally gravitate to them. So yeah, what you experience there with your crossword puzzles is exactly a small scale example of this. And crossword puzzles are really good because it takes a lot of lateral thought to assemble the ridiculous, right? You have to take the sort of ridiculous hint to 
the um, characters that are already form the word and the length of it. Those are very different types of data. What you just described sounds a lot like physics. <laughs> Like oh, wow. Uh, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, especially, you know, ordinary differential equations, solving, yeah, max min problems. There's a whole bunch of stuff in calculus where there's this machinery, right? Physics provides you a bunch of machinery, mathematical machinery, so that if you learn the technique, then you can sort of turn the mathematical crank to get the answer. Formulas. You can assemble them, put them together, but at its best, what it does is provide you the tools to be able to pull things out of your hat, to recognize, well, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, nothing is working. And that's when you need to go and um, distract yourself so that those, those parallel processors can figure out what else to try. If you ever write software, it's very visceral. People, you know, it's like, I'm so close to solving this problem. I'm so close to finding the bug. I'm just going to keep pumping. I know I'm close. I know it. And I just, oh, oh, right. I got I to gotta pee. So you get up and you're halfway to the bathroom. You got like a dozen thoughts that could, could have knocked you, gotten you out of the office two hours ago. Distraction. So um, your model here, it looks like there's a left brain activity and then a right brain activity and back and forth? No, no, it's really not. There, it's, it's a, it's, it's, you know, there's two things, but they aren't left and right. They're, they're both both. Sorry, the, the steps along the, the way. Yeah. That's so I don't, I, so they are, you can kind of think of it that all along we are right. There's focus and defocus, and the focus tends to be more left brain oriented, and the defocus tends to be more right brain. But, um, I would caution about, about taking that too literally because defocusing your left brain does not mean you're shutting it off, right? There's a whole bunch of it that's still making connections and where the magic happens really is when they come together. And I think that it is probably, I don't know, it'll be long after I'm dead in all likeliness, but it's probably a resonant phenomenon where the two, the two sides of the brain come together and hit a frequency or a frequency-like phenomenon where they match and sort of boil up all kinds of, of solutions and ideas. Quick one. Uh, five senses. Five? There are. But what about the sixth sense? I was wondering if in your description of recognition and patterns, if maybe the, that would become the sixth sense or or is that something else you think? So um, we don't need a sixth sense because that's all, all the, the pattern recognition is all inside. So there's no intake of data. It's just processing data. But you know, if you wanted to call that a sense, I'd probably be OK with that. I'd only be offended if you insisted that there was a ghost that was telling you that there was something going on, or if you thought you were reading somebody's mind and you couldn't reproduce it in a lab then I'd be offended. But, I, you know, you could still do it because what am I, your cop, right? <laughs> so, but it, we say five. But really, I, I think you could make the case that balance is a sense, orientation. Because we have the wetware in our brains that we know up from down even when our eyes are closed. So, you know, there's, there's other things like that. So we say five, but really what we mean is, is there's a physical interface to the, to the world. I was wondering about um, the pattern recognition. Is, is, is it so much so that we can't, like do we have to have a pattern for ideas in order to have them? Do we have to have experienced something to build a pattern yeah. in order to later like bring that up as a possibility? So it's a very complicated question. And the short answer is, is yes. Without experience, there's, there is no awareness. There really isn't. Time doesn't pass without experience. And if time doesn't pass, that's sort of the definition of nothing happening. So nothing's happening. But it's more complicated than that um, because uh, if you have never seen a spider or a snake, you will still be afraid of them when you see one. 
Just like if a dog has never seen, or never, more accurately, never smelled a wolf, or better yet, a, um, if, if a bunny rabbit has never smelled, has never smelled fox piss, still gonna be scared shitless of it. So instinct is, is sort of hardwired. You can think of them as hardwired algorithms. And then something like learning a language is where the algorithm's already in place, but none of the parameters have been set. But some of them are really hardwired. At a, you could argue that hardwiring is ex your ancestors' experiences. Yes, exactly. So ultimately it all comes from the five senses, just maybe not yours. I love that. Yeah, that's a very good one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, there's no question about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could totally do it. Yeah. There is there is um I've I've actually in the course of my travels, I've um, met a lot of Nobel Prize winners. And most of them are just not very remarkable. As you know, when you're sitting and having dinner with them, you know, they're kind of, you know, they're just people, right? They're they're not magic. And I mean, a few of them um are, you know, really kind of, you know, they, they got that absent-minded thing down. <laughs> um, Sheldon Glashow was a guy that I, that I hung out with when I was in graduate school for a while. And he's this sort of big, gregarious guy, always with a cigar in his mouth, saying, just flouting, just spouting out dumb ideas, right? Just like, Shelley, that won't work because of this. That won't work because of this. But boy, did he have a few that worked really well. So, so yeah, there's, there's, um, yeah, there's nothing, nothing keeping any of us from making a great discovery. Um, it does require a lot of work and dedication. Maybe it's a preview for, for the other parts of the book, but I was thinking about um, the subconscious mind, or at least when we're, when we're asleep, right, this, this idea. And, um, because as you were talking about, or talking about pattern matching, I was matching experiences in my life to you know discoveries, particular intractable problems that grinding those hours away, sort of like uh, I could see why this plays in the in the computer science realm, the mythical man month, like throw more people at a job and then then it gets solved or more hours. Um, but for me, like one of these things where I solved something was linear. I couldn't solve it went home, dreamed it, and, and had it the next day, right? Even then later being able to understand why it worked, but first having the idea be without understanding why it worked. Is there some um, background to that, what, what processing is happening there in sleep? So um, a couple of things to that. The first one <coughs> is that sleep is neuroscience's dark matter problem, right? You have a lot of Colloquy on dark matter, no one knows what the hell it is. It's like physicists, we claim that we understand everything. I'm a physicist, I know everything. Well, in principle, if not in practice, right? <laughs> but um, don't know what dark matter is, it makes up, I don't know, what is it now, 85% of the universe? It was 95% a decade ago. Um, so sleep, yeah, neuroscience doesn't know what sleep is for. There's a lot of reason to believe that it has to do with defining memories but no real hard conclusive evidence. Doesn't know what sleep is for. I personally, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. I've never done cutting edge research in neuroscience. I just, you know, read a lot of books and talked to a lot of people. And they had to answer me because I had a publisher who would send email to their public information officer if they didn't return my emails. It was great. These great neuroscientists were all at my beck and call. And, <clears throat> sleep, though, sleep, I think it's really a discharge. The funny thing about sleep is there is just no way in hell that natural selection wants you to be defenseless. Sleep, being asleep, is just not an advantage in any way. So why do we do it? Bears do it so that they don't have to hunt during the winter, right? There's a, there's, they can survive. They can be big and burly and need a lot of calories and still get through a winter if they turn off. 
but why do we sleep every night? Why did dogs sleep every, well, most of the time? And um, the answer is not well known, but it does certainly seem to have to do with a scrubbing phenomenon, that you go to sleep and your brain has all of these, I don't know, I, I really think of it as, as they, are, they are action potentials. There's a lot of electrodynamic activity. And as we all know, uh, uh, electrodynamic activity wants to go to ground. It wants to relax. And when you go to sleep, all those thoughts can just kind of blow away. And I think, you know, we are pattern recognizers. So I sort of think, and don't, you know, believe this for any reason, because it's my opinion. But I sort of think that the reason that we have dreams is, is, has nothing to do with, with um, trying to solve any problems. It's more that we're just having all of this electromagnetic activity in our brain sort of going to ground, but our brains are such good pattern recognizers that we assemble this random data into narratives. And that's what our dreams are. So whatever you've been working on in one day, you're likely to have some dream associated with it or some point of novelty will come up. And does that have anything to do with solving a problem? Well, it probably does. Does it have to do with forming memories? It probably does. But yeah, sleep is the dark matter problem. By the way, your hippocampus, which is in your, one of these things in the middle of your brain, in your inner puppy, and these, this is a unique part of your brain because um, unlike the rest of your brain, these are little nodules. So like when you open your guts, you can take out your stomach and your gizzard. Not, I don't know what the hell you have in there, but they're separate in a bucket. They're networked together. This, your inner puppy's like that too. They're little like almond-shaped things and little snail-shaped thing. And some sort of hint. And um, <laughs> the, um, your hippocampus can store information for up to three years before it judges whether that information is worthy of long-term memory. You literally stash, most of the stuff you just eliminate, it comes in and it's not worth keeping, right? You can't remember everything. But some things it just takes up to three years to decide whether you should have that information handy the rest of your life. What is that deciding factor? Is that, um, is it's like attached to an emotion? So yeah, it plays, it's, it, it is all, we are driven by emotions. Yeah, it really is. How important was it? So first impressions are, you know, we all know that first impressions are ridiculously overweighted. That our first impressions carry way too much value when it comes to actually understanding something. But of course they do. You need to be afraid of the saber-toothed tiger the first time you see it. And then every time you see it, so you really don't lose much by being, um, by, well, in nature, in the state of nature, just trying to survive, you don't lose much by overweighting that first impression. So if an impression, whether it's first or, or hundredth, hits you with a great deal of emotion, yes, you will, you will, that will go into your hippocampus and hang out for a while. So that's the, the root of, um, of um, post-traumatic stress, is we get hit with this blast and then, you know, that's going to keep coming up. It's just part of our networking. All right, we're losing the room. If people have continuing have questions, and if Dr. Stevens is happy, we can continue the, the talk session outside. Let's thank Dr. Stevens. Yeah.